Everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to the Critique of the Week for Friday, March 12th. Thanks so much for joining me. It's always a pleasure to do these. Say hello to Aaron Cloyd and James Cicillo. Good to see you. Let's see if we're running everywhere. Over on uh, f- YouTube, we got a smaller crowd, but Warren Nadvoronik is there. Nadvornik is good there. Good to see you, Warren. Uh, Sally D. Hello to Sally D. Lisa Ellison and Josh Williams. How's it going? Lois Perch. Via Mayor. Nice to see you too from Annapolis, Maryland. Okay, so um, as always, the Critique of the Week is a chance to sit around and give everybody that experience, that workshop experience you get from a good writing program or good writer's group. Uh, we sit around and talk about poems and how to make them better. Um, so pay attention as we read these poems to uh, where they work, where they don't, what you ideas you have for improvement and go in new places and making them more interesting. And um, it just helps everybody. It helps, helps me articulate what I think about poems helps helps you think about your own poems and helps the poet a lot by knowing what strangers think of uh, what they read when they encounter them. So let's dive right into the poems this week. And this week we have uh, three poems, really, by um, Gavin Bork. And I want to talk about one thing. We've never actually talked about this on the Critique of the Week, and that is fonts. Now, when Gavin sent these poems in, they were all in this um, French script font. When people ask about fonts normally, I think I let me. I think it's a little washed out. Let me let me fix this document cam for a second. Uh, but when people um, ask me about fonts, I always say just don't worry about it. Like who cares? Um, a little better. There we go. Um, you know, like as long as I can read the poem, it's fine. But but one thing you have to keep in mind is is how the font makes it easier or harder to read. And I find that these kind of script fonts kind of difficult to read and, and what you don't want is a barrier between the reader who is me you know or, or any publisher or editor you're setting this stuff to you don't want any kind of barrier between competition you want it like as smooth as possible no friction you know just slide right into our brains is what you want these poems to do and when there's a font that's like this um you know if, if it would be one thing if we printed things in script fonts all the time and we're used to reading this but um but when we don't, you know, it's decorative and it looks nice, but that doesn't really add anything to the poem. And um, so so don't submit in fonts like this. And, and this is in a light gray color, too. Um, don't mess with the color. Just do black. Just do some kind of regularish font at some kind of regularish size. Um, and that way we can just absorb the poem without having any friction in the way. Um, and... That's all I wanted to say about this. So, so let's. I, I just changed the font to make it easier to read, and this is the actual poem. And uh, I think just Times New Roman. Uh, meet a meeting with the river man. Went down to the river bank to meet the river man one autumn afternoon. I had a few questions of my own to ask them this time. A dead branch half submerged in the water on one side of the still waters signs hang hung high up on high on tree trunks above soaked teddy bears precious memories of lives taken too soon pain slowly moving with time under a cobalt blue sky under the eye of the sun glistening in the water's thin surface why did the river take them when they were vulnerable why did it not have the compassion to hand them back to the bank when I stopped swimming and started floating forever. Needless to say, the river did not answer. But then again, the river is not human, imbued with the capacity for reason and pure reason and reasoning and rationality. Looking up, had to blink twice. A rope was not attached from the neck of a solitary or a stationary man to the branch of a tree. It was a line from a rod being cast by an earnest fisherman that day, All was still and silent apart from the ducks and drakes cleaning themselves off fervently on a strange day in a good way. 
Evening began its vespers and canticles and lit candles as it saw fit. The lightest breeze, unsuspecting sounds of drakes, resembled agony, the water moving slowly on the slow day. The air coated in cobweb static, the chills of red autumn leaves, vibrant orchestral colors, only to be seen within a short window, once yearly to be treasured by those who noticed them as a fleet of birds flew through the sky at an exact right angle, perfectly together. The more the seeming mer seemingly merrier was odd to see for some strange reason, but signaled possibilities for unity of meaning and purpose. So that is a meeting with the river man. And now the thing that stands out obviously in this poem are all of these, um, all of these commas everywhere that just, um, I'm, I'm wondering what the purpose is. I mean, they, they almost seem like maybe, um, cause these aren't where commas are supposed to be. Right. So it seems like maybe they want to break up the rhythm and slow the poem down, but why, why commas and not line breaks? Uh, you know, if you want to slow the poem down and, and have us like pause here, why not just line break the poems here, have them short lines, um, with commas there, it feels, it's very difficult to read. It feels very stilted, breaking it up that way. It feels very disjointed, hard to follow really what's going on. So, um, so the first thing I would do is just, um, you know, you got to get rid of these, these commas, make them line breaks if you want. Um, but, but let the, the poem read smooth. It's like, uh, it's sort of like listening to, um, you know, human speech, we talk about this on the Rattlecast all the time, but human speech is naturally musical. I, mean, I think we talked about it with A.E. Stallings most recently in a couple episodes ago. But um, but the way human speech flows out, there's a way that we're evolved to it, and it's sort of a part of music in a way that makes it automatically musical. And the effect of throwing in commas here makes it feel like if you're um, like starting and stopping a tape recording or something. Like, it's, it, it's very... Um, I don't know, very sort of unsettlingly distracting. Um, so, so don't do that. Get rid of that. Have regular, um, regular punctuation uh, that we would expect. So again, similar to the way we talked about already, that you don't want the script to get in the way. Um, you also don't want the punctuation to get in the way. You want us to, to absorb the poem really simply and hear the music of it and then take something away from it. So... Um, so that's the first thing. So, so now that we're done with that, let's get rid of the extra commas, use regular commas usage uh, like we normally would. If you want to slow the poem down, use line breaks. Um, that's that. But the good thing about this poem that I really liked are the, um, the images. There is a lot of really physical detail that works really well. And it sits, if you do, as long as you're not getting distracted by the punctuation and setup, um, the images really f work well. They flow, no pun intended. So a meeting with the river man is a good title. Um, you know, it sets the stage kind of, we know what we're doing. We're meeting with the river man and the river kind of, that he's the river man kind of tells us where we are. And so it sort of sets us up. It, it's a working title. Went down to the river bank to meet the river man one autumn afternoon. I had a few questions of my own to ask them this time. And so why this time? I mean, I guess that implies that you always, um, there, there's a lot of clutter in this, uh, in this, uh, poem so let's kind of cut out the clutter i think this time is clutter a dead branch half submerged in the water on one side of the still waters signs hung high up on tree trunks above soaked teddy bears precious memories we don't need the precious memories kind of a cliche um or maybe i mean since you have you have this here maybe just change it but don't don't make it a cliche um Let's see. Yeah, under cobalt blue sky, under the eye of the sun, glistening. The so glistening is sort of a cheesy kind of word. Um, the sun and the water's thin surface. Why did the river take them when they were vulnerable? So the take them. So these lives taken too soon. Why did the river take them when they were vulnerable? Why did it not have the compassion to hand them back to the bank when they stopped swimming and started floating forever? That's an interesting question. I mean, um, I guess this is a, a river where many people have drowned. Needless to say, the river did not answer. But then again, the river is not human, imbued with the capacity for reason. Well, I guess it would be not imbued, right? With the capacity for reason and pure reason and reasoning and rationality. So this, this, um, 
little riff here. Um, you know, it's a little too much. Like it just repeats the same thing. I don't know what the um, purpose of, you know, without the capacity for reason and rationality would be enough, but why the pure reason and reasoning and rationality. So probably cut that just to smooth it up a little bit. Look up, had to blink twice. A rope was not attached from the neck of a stationary man to the branch of a tree. It was a line from a rod being cast by an earnest fisherman. So these, well, the one thing we talk about is adjectives are the weakest, um, weakest ways to tell a story. And so get rid of an earnest. We don't need, we don't need those kind of details. It's kind of, adjectives are very show, don't tell -y. You know, they, they tell too much instead of showing it. So if the fisherman is earnest, explain what about his posture or something makes him earnest. Um, that day was all, all was still and silent apart from the ducks and drakes cleaning themselves off fervently and a strange day in a good way. So I like these ducks and drakes cleaning themselves off. I, I like this, you know, the picture of the image, the image of the fisherman that you get in your head. Um, and then the ducks and the drakes cleaning themselves. I like that this is, you know, uh, we can imagine a story, a scene that's playing out here. Someone's going down to the riverbank, wondering about death, and then comes upon this fisherman, and, and the scene's painted nicely. So that's really, the poem's got that going for it. Um, I'm not sure what on a strange day in a good way means. Kind of a, a question there. Um, evening began its vespers and canticles and lit its candles as it saw fit. That's another nice description of the light fading. In the lightest breeze, unsuspecting sounds of drakes resembled agony. So that's a strange turn. The water moving slowly on the slow day. So what's the slow day? Again, I'm just, I don't know what what some of these references are. The good way and the slow day. The air coated with cobwebs. I like the air coated with cobwebs, static. The chills of red autumn leaves are good descriptions here. Uh, vibrant orchestral colors. So vibrant, you know, again, vibrant is that weak adjective. See how much better orchestral is. I mean, orchestral is an adjective too, but it's an adjective that's sort of rooted in a noun. So you can sort of see it at the same time as you feel it. Only to be seen within a short window, once yearly, to be treasured by those who notice them as a fleet of birds. I like the fleet of birds. Flew through the sky in the exact right angle, perfectly together, the more the seemingly merrier was odd to see. So again, this odd to see, you know, I, it's just a question. I don't understand. There's some of these like little, you know, I mean, what is in a good way? What is odd to see? What is a slow day? But I like the, um, I like the birds though, the right angle, perfectly together, the more the merrier for some strange reason, but signal possibilities for unity and meaning and purpose. And again, this end is very show don't tell. And um you know, so so the the poem at the end, which is the most common thing a poem does, um, is a sort of edit that you might want to think of. There's really two. The two most common edits in a poem are to cut off the beginning where there's some kind of preamble that's not necessary, and to cut off the ending that explains. Because a lot of times we get to the end of the poem and we have this um feeling that uh, what the meaning that we intended to get across isn't gotten across. And then so we write a few extra lines to explain it. And um, that's what's done here for some strange reason, but signaled possibilities for unity and meaning and purpose. So you want, when you're writing a poem, um, hopefully this is ideally the sort of process of writing a poem. So you, you're, um, you're creating a scene in your mind and you're sort of going into this meditative place. It's like a different world, a whole different landscape. And then you went there, you were drawn there for some reason, and you're trying to figure out the reason you were. And that's kind of how a poem works, or how any piece of art really works. You're like, there's an itch or something that you're compelled, that you're driven toward, and you're trying to understand it. And then through that process of understanding, you're letting us understand too. And that's why art works. And this poem does that um, because, it, you know, why, why are we talking about this river man? Why are we thinking about the drowned people, you know, there's this questioning in here um, that, that plays out through the image and scene, and it really works. And then as we get to the end, this is the revelation. This is what we come to understand um, through going into this new landscape. But you've told us instead of shown it. So, um, you know, so, so really what you have to do, the, the, the structure of the poem is laid out right, you know, in a way that works. Uh, but you have to get us to this conclusion without telling us what the conclusion is. 
Because you want us to, you know, the reason, like, like imagine show don't tell is just, imagine how much easier it is to have some kind of, um, if you're teaching someone how to fix a leaky faucet, right? It's so much easier to watch a YouTube video where it's being shown and, and you can participate with it and go along with the people who are doing it than to read like step-by-step instructions. And that's really what show don't tell is. It allows the, the process to be immersive and let us experience um, what we're trying to do. And um, so telling is like just giving us some instructions at the end almost. And there's no real resonance. There's no, it's not, it's not powerful or memorable to do it that way. So we have to find a way to come to this conclusion just through these images and just through what, what happens. And um, so that's where to go with this poem, I think. It's a, a long description. Sorry for, uh, for going on without looking at the comments, but let's see what people are saying about it. Uh, Jennifer Edwards says, I agree, a hard time reading it because of the commas. I think we need to be considerate of those with dyslexia. Much harder for them. I, it's harder for me to read, too, when I don't have dyslexia. Um, Sherry Pop says, I wonder if the poet feels the script fits the topic, but also, yeah, so the script should never really fit the topic. Like poems, I mean, maybe if you were making some kind of broadside as an art piece, um, then, then the script matters and should fit with the topic. But we're, we want to be taken with a poem to another place. And if you're focused on the fonts and things like that, that t- takes you away from that movement to another place that we're looking for. So um, let's see. Um, so Hege uh, Lepri says, as the mother of a low vision daughter, accessibility goes down the drain with strange fonts and low contrast colors. Yeah. So everyone's talking about the the, um, the fonts. Sherry Puff says, I like the occasional internal rhyme as well. Yeah, it was almost hard to hear the music because of all the commas. But if you sort of listen and, and sort of ignore the commas, there are a lot of nice internal rhymes and there is music. Um, let's see. Uh, Nate Jacobs says a soaked teddy bear is a bit of a cliche too. Um, I don't know. Is that a cliche? It's a little bit of a, I don't know. Have I, I can't think of another poem I've read with a soaked teddy bear. Does anybody else think that's a cliche? Um, teddy bears in the trees indicate a flood. Interesting. Hmm. Let's see. So may, maybe that is, I, I just didn't, it's not something that registers as a metaphor to me really. T.R. Paulson says, beautiful, haunting imagery. Clearly something terrible happened, but I don't know what. Did someone die? D- did someone die here? Or is the speaker just thinking about death? My suggestion is to write out in prose exactly what happened. Then try a fairly loose form like rhyming quatrains or something. Then take the best of both drafts and write a new draft. That's good advice, yeah. Um, especially the, the writing it out. Like, write the actual story down. And then work that content into a poem. And, and maybe that's the way to do it. Cause we just don't, we don't get the, you know, we don't get to this. Con- we don't feel, we don't feel like we don't feel that the weight of this conclusion, which has been told to us um, because we haven't really experienced the journey, you know? Um, like we don't really know, you know, what the actual situation is. And um I don't know. I mean, the point should be to tell this. There's a story here, and the point should be to tell the story. And so writing out in prose is a really good suggestion from, from T.R. Paulson. Um, uh, Nate Jacobs says, I'd like to see that meaning purpose expressed at the end of this. Um, Mark A. Greener says it can end on perfectly together. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, too. Thanks, Mark. So perfectly together right here. That could be the ending. Um it really could. Come on. Um, you know, what you want is to end on an image like this. I mean, poems don't have, there's a million ways poems can work. You don't have to do, end on an image that, that sort of hits home every time. There's a lot of ways you can end a poem. But uh, one way that works very well is to end on an image that means something, you know? And so this image has the meaning, which was explained later. But the, the meaning is in it. So that makes a good ending. Um, as the fleet of birds flew through the sky at an exact right angle, perfectly together. And that really actually is a great ending, I would say. Um, you can't see I'm writing great ending over there. Um, but I think that's a great ending. Uh, it just, it, we have to sort of be with you the whole way and, um, and sort of a little bit more knowing what's up so we can be with you. Uh, Mark Rainier also says, uh, for some reason, this reminds me of Elliot's The Wasteland. 
Uh, James Asilla says the river man is in the title and in the beginning, but then isn't it in the remainder of the poem. And um, yeah, that, that is true. Um, and who was the, was the fisherman, the river man in disguise? Maybe was the river. I mean, how, what I thought about this poem actually was that the river man was sort of the essence of the river somehow being embodied through these different characters. So it was the river itself at the beginning and then it was the fishermen, and then it was the birds, and kind of the river transition through the, which is an interesting idea. Um, I just don't think it was fully developed um, yet. Uh, let me see. So Sherry Puss says, I've seen flooded riverbanks and trees are full of unusual, shocking things. That's my view of the teddy bears. Interesting. Um, and Hege Anita Jacobson Lepre says, uh, this is just a really well put comment, Hege. Uh, there are beautiful images, but many of them are lost in the commentary on it that seems to come just as an image starts to feel real. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, so, so, so here's, I think my main advice would be to kind of com combine Hege's advice here and T.R. Paulson's advice. Um, tell the story in prose, maybe. Don't think about making it a poem. Just tell, tell what you want to tell. Um, and then try to make it a, a much more condensed poem, just focusing on the images of it. Um, and that and that might be the way to go, without this kind of commentary about the reason, um, and definitely without all the commas everywhere, because that's just distracting. Um, okay, I think that does it for this poem. Let's do, there are two more, and the other two are much shorter. So we might be able to do both of them. I don't know. There's, it's been 20 minutes, but let's see. So originally, too, this was in that French script, which I... Um, put back into time so it'd be easier to read return to human now, i haven't read any of these poems before these are all fresh so i'm looking at them like i would uh, a submission return to human for arthur sheridan um and and actually uh, let me point out so return to human is an interesting title it makes you kind of slightly curious and then for arthur sheridan actually helps a lot you don't know who arthur is i mean i don't uh, maybe there's a person that we we could know uh, oh, you know what? I totally forgot to switch over to YouTube. Let me look at the YouTube comments for the other poem first before we move on. Because um, there, are, there are a good number of comments over here. Sorry, everybody, for, for focusing on Facebook. Um, let's see. So Sally D says ducks and drakes. Ducks and drakes is a game of throwing flat stones so that they skim along the surface of the water. The term drake refers exclusively to males, while the term duck can refer to either gender. That's interesting. Um, interesting comment on that phrase. Warren Nedvornik says, I haven't read Soaked Teddy Bears, but I've seen Cobalt Blue Sky a lot. Oh, that's a good one to point out. Yeah, that's definitely a cl cliche. And the problem with cliches um, is, that, is that they don't register in our brains. Like what what what's really makes something memorable is that... Um, it's like a new constellation of neurons. It's like new wiring in our brains. And then, and then that like sticks. And that's why poems get exciting because they rewire our brains, you know. And the problem with the cobalt blue sky is that's a constellation of phrases and phonemes and images that's already combined in our brains into sort of one unit. So we don't get the same firing out of it. And that's really why cliches don't work. And so cobalt blue sky um, is a cliche, although Caitlin points out it's better than Azure, yeah. Azure is even worse for the blue sky. Um, Leo Becker says summer poems. Uh, TR, Terry R. Um, suggests a perfect right angle for the ending, which is very similar to, uh, I think it was James DeSillo's suggestion for the ending. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's move on to the next poem now. And I will promise I will, I will look at both YouTube and Facebook for this poem as we go. Um, but here's Return to Human, with that for Arthur Sheridan at the beginning. Bravely was on his knees pleading, saw the third eye, overpowered, unsecured, through the steel-rimmed portholes, half-fogged above the water level, behind the glass an epoch on the slow-leaking vessel. Prayed for the third eye to open one more time, even to blink, now closed, infected in real danger, bobbing with the chip-chopping waters. The corneas and conjunctivas caught up in a cycle of serious yet unpreventable temporary decay and decline. Took the wheel to steady the bow in the water for it, 
to stay afloat until it had passed the sharp rocks and ridges towards calmer, more assured seas to sail more gently, steadily and sustainably, to return to fully human once again. So this poem, you know, we have the same, um, some of the same issues which we won't belabor because the, the commas interrupt. Um, there's just, there's no reason for commas here. And they just throw you off. Beverly was on his knees. Maybe the, that one was necessary. Pleading. Saw the third eye. Overpowered. There's just a bunch that are not necessary. Um, and that like, breaks it up again. Um, just have regular comma usage. There's no... You know, you should let the, the words pause. Like the, the phraseology of the music lets the reader know where to pause. You don't need to tell us where you want us to slow down. Um, so half fogged. Is here, like half fogged above the water level. There's no reason for that, comma. Um, Return to human for Arthur Sheridan. So Warren Nedvornik says bravely. Um, I think the adverb weakens the opening, especially since brave is abstract. Yeah, I think so too. Cut that. Just was on his knees pleading. Um... Mather Schneider down here says there should be a comma after once in the last line. I think he's messing with this again. Um, let's see. Um, over on Facebook. Let's see. You got to go down more. Sharon Friday says I don't even use commas anymore. Yeah, you could write in a style with no commas. Um, and yeah, yeah, this, if you could, you could write this with no commas, um, but, but the best, we just don't want to be thinking about commas, you know, I want to be thinking about the story. I want to be thinking about the images. I don't want to be thinking about, um, whether or not a comma should be there. Like that just breaks the fourth wall, as they say. And I'm just in a theater again, watching somebody, you know, act on stage instead of, uh, being absorbed in the play. Um, so anyway, return to human was on his knees. I don't know if it's Arthur Sheridan on his knees. Pleading. Saw the third eye, overpowered, unsecured, through the steel-rimmed portholes, half-fogged above water level, behind the glass, an epoch on the slow-leaking vessel. So again, there are great images here. Um, you know, there's a very imagistic way that the, this this poem is, works, and, and the other poem, too, that sort of carries an interest, even though there's some other things that make you trip up and makes it tough to follow. Um, just having this like half, um, the steel rim portholes half fogged above the water level. That's a really great little description that paints the scene and puts you into place behind the glass and epoch on the slow leaking vessel. We're really there with these images and see how much work just some images can do. It's not that many images. It's not that like, you know, it's not written in some amazing way that nobody could do, but just having these images there gives us something to grab onto and, and, lose ourselves in a little bit it creates a little world for us which is what we're trying to do with poems prayed for the third see i don't know what this third eye is prayed for the third eye to open one more time even to blink now closed infected in real danger bobbing see when we get the bobbing with the chopping waters even though we don't need all these weird commas um still good images here um, i don't know what this third eye is but as soon as it bobs with the chopping waters i kind of am, am back in the poem again even though i don't know what's going on um, and that's how powerful images are. So just a note for everybody at home to pay attention to that. The corneas and conjunctivas caught up in a cycle of serious yet unpreventable temporary decay and decline. So I'm just not following this stuff. But when they're good images, I'm still back in the poem. Um, so so took the wheel. So it must be the hymn that took the wheel uh, to steady the bow in the water for it to stay afloat until it had passed the sharp rocks and ridges <laughs> towards calmer. Yeah, man, there, you are just... <laughs> um, rocks and ridges toward calmer, more assured seas to sail more gently, steadily, and sustainably to return to fully human once again. Hmm. So he, is it like... Um, I mean, I'm wondering, I don't know how to interpret this poem. I, the images get make me have some interest. I'm, I'm kind of imagining, this is my interpretation, but it's so, um, 
it's opaque enough that I'm not sure if this is the right thing, but I'm imagining Arthur Sheridan as some kid, maybe in the bathtub or maybe um, in a pool or something, just pretending to be a boat. Um, I don't know what how the third eye plays into that, but um, the, when the imagination sort of fades away, that's when he becomes fully human again. That's that's how I may be interpreting it. Um, let's see. So Hege uh, says the third eye is what allows you to have perception beyond the ordinary. Yeah, definitely, I know that. But the question is what that has to do with this poem. Um, what does that have to do with him, this ship sinking, and and why is the third eye bobbing with the chopping waters? Uh, what are the why, why does it have corneas and conjunctivas? Conjunctivas uh, caught up in the cycle. It's just the third eye seems like out of nowhere. Um, in this poem, I don't know what to, I mean, I know what it, what it, you know, some kind of sixth sense or, or that kind of thing, but what does it have to do with this, this situation? I'm not sure how it fits in. So Annie Yin says, guess he's repairing and fixing the water pipe also himself. That's interesting. Um, hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know how literal to take to take the 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 float part, because at the end he turns human. We talk about this third eye. I'm just not sure where to go with this poem. Um, let's see. Let me go over on YouTube and see what people are saying there. Um, so Richard Westheimer says, if the poet would take out every adjective and adjective phrase and then try to strengthen the nouns before adding any adjectives back, the images would unfold. Yeah, that's always a good piece of advice for poems. And Richard's great with. Uh, Great with images, so he's a good person to listen to, too. Um, uh, Paul Corbiel says, I feel pulled in by this poem. Overall, the images work for me. Yeah, the, the images work. I just don't know what to do with it. So, um, And Richard Westheimer says, also, what is at stake? That's a better way to put it, probably, than I don't know what to do with it. Uh, what's at stake in this poem? I mean, why does it matter? Uh, it's, uh, Richard Westheimer says, I, I know that's a cliched question, but it just doesn't feel like this matters to the poet. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure what to, to take from it. So I just want to be let in again. Like the images sort of keep me occupied. And so I'm not like completely bored. Um, I, like I'm taken there because there's nice images, but I don't know where there is or why I've been taken there. And so that's why we need the uh, story behind it or, or just letting us into what is meant by this third eye and things like that more. Um, and Sally D puts it this way. If, I, if we knew what he was pleading for at the beginning... Maybe the rest of the poem would make sense. That's true, too. Good point. And someone mentioned pleading in a different comment. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was Sally D before. Pleading for what? Um, where was the pleading? Where, where was the pleading? Did I miss it? Or maybe Sally's behind and she's talking about the other poem. Pleading? Let's see. Beverly. Grass. Maybe that was the other poem that had the pleading. Maybe, uh. Maybe Sally's behind. Did I have a pleading in it? Let's see. I'm not seeing the pleading there either. Hmm. Well, but but this the thing the um the point apply it applies though, is that we just need to know what's going on a little more so we can take something from it. Um, what's everything? Do you want to hear the the, the last poem here? Um, the last poem is the shortest. Let's just do it really quick. And we'll see um, if it's got the comma issue, I'll pretend it doesn't and just read it without the commas because we already talked about that. Living with death. The first brush comes shortly after birth. No one prepares you for the delayed reaction over your whole lifetime. The oldest generation first, followed by the next and then the next until it is us to face time's natural times. That should be it. Time's natural guillotine. Time's natural guillotine is nice. The, the um, use of possessives are wrong. Sharpened steel edges. Or maybe maybe just the comma messes up. Time's natural guillotine sharpened. It's just hard to read because of the commas and stuff. Um, we are left living until we are not with their absence and our loss. 
We can never be replaced by another's DNA as no two materialize in exactly the same way. To never again see that person is one of the cruelest and most inevitable fates in any life's time. So what's interesting here, just for the last poem, is, is this poem sort of lets us know a little bit more what to take from it, um, but doesn't have the same images to pull us in. It's kind of an interesting inversion of the first two poems we saw. The first brush comes shortly after birth. So we're living with death. So we're talking, that, that sets us up. And then the first brush with death, I assume, shortly come, comes shortly after birth. No one prepares you. And so this is all kind of abstract. But since we know this is sort of the situation, that's enough to keep us a little bit engaged, even though we don't have the images that kept us engaged with the other poems. If you can combine them both, that's how it's really, you know, firing on all cylinders. Uh, no one prepares you for the delayed reaction of your whole lifetime. So, so we know we're talking about death, and we're really grounded in what we're talking about. The oldest generation first, followed by the next, and then the next, until it is us. To face time's natural guillotine. I, I like time's natural guillotine. Uh, sharp, with, with it sharpened steel edges or something. Uh, we are left living until we are not. With our absence and our loss... I like with their absence and our loss. There's, see how there's a nice music to that? With their absence and our loss. There's a way that it f- flows through your mouth. Replaced by another DNA as no two materialize in exactly the same way. To never again see that person is one of the cruelest and most inevitable fates in any life's time. So maybe this is unnecessary. I'd probably just cut that all. Um, but now here we get, you know, like I said, we get more of, this, more of the um, story. Um, let's see. So, what was this first line? Oh, there's the pleading. You're right. I'm sorry. I, I kind of... There's the pleading right there. Yeah, why is he pleading? Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, I think that's it for the Critique of the Week today. Um, I think we kind of went over these poems. There's a, a lot of things that could be uh, worked on, and um, interesting to see what comes of them. So thanks so much to uh, Gavin Bork for sharing these. And um, let me see if there's any other comments. Uh, Warren Warren Nadvernick says, uh, I wonder if all these commas are supposed to function like Emily Dickinson's dashes, though they still interrupt the reading experience for me. They, they Also, they hide the unnecessary commas. So I think the difference between Emily Dickinson's dashes and these is, is they're actually like disruptions. And all that's really being disrupted here is the flow of the speech. Like, nothing's changing. Like, the, what comes after a comma here in Dickinson is sort of surprising, uh, with a dash in Dickinson. With a comma here, it's just the continuation of the sentence. So you don't get anything out of it. Um, and, and, and Dickinson, it's sort of this weird... What makes it a, a interesting style is that it's a um, sort of like a parallel world or something. It's like Schrodinger's cat. Every It's like you're going out of that schrodinger's cat box every time you pass a dash and it's like reality shifts a little bit and uh, that's why that works so that doesn't work in the same way to me it feels like he wants you know the author wants um us to read it a certain way and it's trying to guide us like you would with musical notes or something but you just it doesn't really work that way with that text on the page so i think that's what's going on there anyway that is the critique of the week for today um, thanks, everybody, for joining me, as always. It's always a pleasure to do these, take a little break and go over a couple poems and drink my coffee. Um, now, before we uh, go, let me tell you that, uh, of course, we have the Open Mic Show coming up on uh, Sunday, noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific. That's an open mic for any poems about current events you would like to share. And then this week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be Wendy Vidalock. Uh, that is, she's one of my favorite poets, very unique writer, um, sort of has a condensed, very metrical rhyming style, which is always a surprise, um, a great poet, Wendy Vidalock, and, um, looking forward to talking to her, the, the, um, let me look up really quick, I always forget to, uh, have this handy, the, uh, prompt for this week's open mic on the rattle cast was give your poem a utopian or dystopian setting. So sort of a, there's something great that the um, Science Fiction Poetry Association, so you can write your uh, utopian or dystopian poem and then uh, submit it there after we 
We share them on Rattlecast number 84 after we talk for an hour and read some poems by Wendy Vidalock. And that is Tuesday, March 16th, 9 p.m. Eastern Time with Wendy Vidalock on Rattlecast 84. Hope to see you then. And I uh, hope to see you Sunday, too. Have a good rest of your Friday. Talk to you later. Goodbye. <laughs>